once again for joining us. I'm so excited to be talking to Jane White. Um, we are about to talk about transformation and leadership and really want to get some insights from her on her journey and how that has led to the transformations that she's been a part of. Uh, Jane, I'm really excited to talk to you. We really want to use this as an opportunity to share some of the transformational experiences, to share the experience from leaders and to inspire others uh, on this leadership journey. So we'll start by asking you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Hi, well, first of all, I'm so glad to be holding this space with you. It is a new year. Uh, my name is Jane White. I am the first female CEO of the business supply group, two divisions, Script J and Boss. And I've been in this role, uh, the merged role for the group for just a little over a year. And previously the CEO and Boss for about three and a half years. And I'm just loving it, looking forward to this little time that we're gonna spend together. You know, one of my favorite topics is leadership and how we can push that agenda, especially for women and those of all diverse backgrounds. Beautiful. So when did you know you wanted to lead? When did you first have that inclination? I actually think it was a gradual thing over time. I think I, you know, struggled in high school and my early school days. So I was always the class clown. I was not the one that you came for to lead you in the right direction. I was never a prefect. I was never a head girl, none of those things. So it definitely wasn't apparent to myself or anyone that I knew. And I think even when I got to that CEO level a couple of years ago, even some of my family were shocked. So leadership wasn't something that was just known or easy for me. And I think over time, as I started to hone my skills in education and learned what worked for me, because I got a lot of C's, I was not very good at math. So this traditional smart was not something that I had. And it was only in university learning how to study and realizing that I was like, hey, if I apply myself in a certain way, I can actually excel. And feeling that power and confidence for the first time, maybe in my mid-20s, is when I first started to think, hey, maybe I could do something more with myself, you know. And previous to that, I think I wanted to be like a secretary. My mom was a secretary. It's a great profession, you know, for some people who want to be led and are good support to someone else. And I didn't see myself as a leader until I started, you know, I came back home from school and I started seeing myself a little bit differently. And it definitely helped in analyzing how I saw myself and reflecting. And it was only after getting back from university and going to nine interviews and being declined by all except one, which was an executive assistant, that I started to feel like, I can do this. Like all the no's fueled me even more to know this was something that I wanted to do. I wanted a managerial role. I wanted to succeed and I kept on pushing and I actually got my first HR manager role and it came from that confidence that I had started building, you know? So that's just like the beginning stories, but it, it definitely wasn't, she's a leader, but a natural born leader, you know? Well, I love that because I think there's so many uh, young women who uh, aren't, no one is egging them on to take on a leadership role. And so it is the confidence in yourself and also realizing that, listen, um, you know, let some of the people who don't believe in you be the thing that fuels you to show that you have the ability to achieve. So I love that. So tell us a little bit about some of the milestones on your career tra trajectory. You were, you, you, your first leadership role was as an HR manager. What, what happened? Um, how did you get into that? And, and what happened leading on from that? So uh, I would have gotten that job. I was the least experienced. And when I saw the job description, I saw 15 to, you know, 10 to 15 years experience. And I remember being so upset. Um, and after I felt like I bombed the interview, the owner called me and he was like, are you, 
you come come to dinner with me. So we actually went to dinner at Jenny's. Like, I think it was like 6 p.m. I can remember it clearly. And he's like, tell me why you could do this job if you're the least experienced. Because I had said, like, I don't have this experience. And I said, you know, I know that no matter what, I can figure it out. You know, and he took a chance on a young person. So I felt really grateful for that opportunity. But I knew then it would always be hard work. And stemming from that position, I knew that, okay, I did, you know, the smaller family run organization and that I have my set sites, uh, my site set on a bigger international company. After doing the head of the HR in that small firm, I then progressed into Scotiabank, which I loved my experience and that journey. I had three uh, positions in that, um, that company including reporting into Toronto. So I actually, my last position in Scotiabank was the head of training and performance consultant for the English speaking Caribbean. Nice. Yeah, so I definitely had a lot of managerial roles throughout that period and then felt like I really wanted to go back into a smaller company because, you know, there's so many benefits of being in a small organization. And then when you get, you want a big organization. And when you get to a big organization, you're like, oh, I miss some of those small organizations. Yeah. intimacies of a small organization. And, and also the lack of bureaucracy in a small organization. Oh, for sure. For sure. The amount of uh, justifications and just give me a one page. I'm like, oh, I'm going to shoot myself with the next one page that I do, you know? Um, so I went, I went back into um, a smaller organization, and that is where at Boss I then grew into the um, CEO position. I actually learned the CEO role because being in HR after maybe a year or two years, I was like, I can do this job, you know. And, and one of the things that I think, knowing that I wanted to lead at a higher level, I just felt like I want an opportunity to make the final decision. Yeah. I want an opportunity to change the course of the future of an organization and by extension, all the people that work within that ecosystem because I can make people's lives better because mm -hmm. at the very start, I was always a class clown, loving people, wanting to make people laugh and enjoy my time on this earth. And I feel like that is also what's propelled me to continue to be higher because the higher that you are, it's, it's your decision. You can create the culture. Yeah. Yeah, you can create can have an impact. Exactly. You can have that impact. And I think that's what's continued to drive me or along the way. So when the position came to take over the group CEO role, I was like, yes, great. You know, going into a different um, level, going into a different number of people's lives that you affect. And so that's just kind of been the summary of my journey so far. Wonderful. And so what would how would you describe yourself as a leader? I would like to think, you know, if I walked out the room, that people could say that I'm passionate, um, driven, empathetic, and honest. I would like to think so, because I, I do feel that my leadership style is empowering others to reach inside themselves and kind of challenge themselves to take ownership of their departments and their area. And whether you are a warehouse attendant packing a shelf, and you know how to pack it better, tell me that idea. And I think I've created a space where people feel like if anyone in my organization can walk up to me and give me a solution mm. or tell me honestly, like, Jane, this is not working. And I would say, tell me, tell me why. Why yeah. do you think? What's better? So it's, it's really creating a leadership where I have co-creators of the business that I run. And that's really what I'm I'm trying to do. So I would I would hope people would say something like that. You know, it's funny, you were talking about the the fact that you wanted to be the one that made the final decision. And you are allowing and empowering your people to be final decision makers on their journey. And there's so many people out there who will say, oh, they're working and they're they're complaining and they have great ideas and they don't have an opportunity to share those ideas. And they don't have an opportunity to implement the changes that they want to see. Well, yeah. by taking on greater leadership, they have that opportunity because not everybody is led by somebody like you who yeah. will empower them or listen to them or open up and say, tell me a better way to do this. But mm -hmm. you know, I, I love that you have taken what was happening with you on your journey and then using that to empower others and to help them get excited and feel a sense of um, not just 
ownership, but a, self, a sense of self-determination in their work. Yeah, definitely. So what, what would you, um, what were some of the more important things that you learned along the way? You know, I, I know you, you didn't sort of wake up class <laughs> clown knowing that, listen, this is, this is the, the kind of impact that I want to have and the impact that I want to have on people's lives. So what are some of the really important things that you learned along the way in this leadership journey? I think one of the things I learned was from one of my um, previous bosses, Mr. DeGans, Martin DeGans. He always, whenever I was freaking out, which I'm a very passionate person, so I go quickly into, oh my God, we have to do something. You know, I always want to do something. <laughs> he um, had said to me, he said, Jane, you know, sometimes you just, you just do nothing. And I was like, I don't understand what you're saying. Right. <laughs> I was like, you're going to need to explain that to me he's like everything that you're feeling right now all the anxiety all the, the options that you've laid out before me that you want to do it's emotional it's impulsive and I think you should just pause you know so just do nothing come back tomorrow and reassess and I was always like this man is crazy he wants me to do nothing um, and that's honestly sometimes some of the most useful advice that I have continued to give myself in those moments where you just want to leap into action down someone's throat to make an impulsive decision. Um, sometimes taking a, a step back and seeing how something unfolds, um, especially as a leader, because I mean, my tendency, as I said, like I like to make decisions. I like to do things while I like to hear from other people. I do have a tendency to jump in. Um, so sometimes as a leader, sitting back and just taking a moment and see how it unfolds, a lot of things resolve itself. And when and when he said that to me, you know, Jane, sometimes when you take a step back, things resolve itself. I was like, this man is crazy. Resolve itself. I'm going to fix everything, you know? So, um, <laughs> yeah, I know. And I think I do that still sometimes. And I, and I think that there's moments where you step back yeah. And, you know, do nothing. And then there's definitely moments to act. And I think it's, it's as you grow, you will kind of find the, um, the intuition to lean into, to know when to act and when to just let, let it be for a minute. So. Yeah, and sometimes to just be more mindful and, and give yourself the space to, to understand how you think and feel and to sort of really assess the, the situation and give yourself a little distance from it. So I think um, that's absolutely some great advice and certainly something that I've I've, has been useful to me because I'm, yeah. I'm somewhat impulsive myself. And sometimes, <laughs> you know, taking a little pause works out really, really well. Yeah. Tell me about some of the mistakes that you made along the way. I think because I am an impulsive person, you know, when I wanted to deal with a performance issue um, with some of my own staff, my thing is let's deal with it. Let's you know, rip off the band-aid, let's, you know, go and say the situation and let's get it over with. Let's not let it ruminate and destroy a whole department. So um, I was always so eager to have those conversations. Uh, there was, you know, a couple times and one in particular is like burnt in my memory where I was underprepared. As a leader, I was coming in to give a performance conversation where I was trying to pull someone up. And because I did not have all my ducks in a row, all my facts of the situation she came in and just like if we were playing some sort of match she won like 100% won she actually lied but she, she defended herself so well and yeah. covered it so well and challenged me to provide proof that I did not have um there was nowhere for me to go but to say, um, okay, well, yes, you're right. I don't have the number of times when that happened. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just take a pause. <laughs> and if I have any other questions, I'll come back to you, you know. And I, and I remember starting off that meeting being like, I'm a boss girl. I'm going to deal with this conversation. And when she left my office, I was like, oh, my God, I was so <laughs> underprepared. What was I thinking? And I, I told myself, I was like, I'm never letting this happen. I am way too smart to have had that happen to me. And I knew, I knew the truth, but I right. did not have the facts. Yeah. You know? and, and being um, in an organization, not everybody 
is going to tell you the truth, especially when there's a performance concern. And sometimes people lie to themselves and lie to others, and they're, they're trying to save their, their own selves, right? So being prepared and organized, not just for performance management conversations, obviously for anything, but it just taught me a hard lesson. And that yeah. um, some people are way more interested in a meeting than you think they are. Ah, yes. And, and you know, it's, I, I, several times I've said um, in my, you know, one of the, one of the challenges, uh, the biggest challenge I think in leadership is, is leading people and not, not the, actually the work, but you yeah. know, people worked just half as hard at doing the work as they do sometimes avoiding the work, you know, performance would be amazing, but alas, you know, if, Sometimes people are just in the wrong fit, and that and that. Yeah. Can change. However, you know that's really interesting to the the, the preparation. But one of the the challenges for women sometimes is that we over prepare, and so whereas um, men may sort of run into a situation half prepared and and feel like that's enough, women tend to over prepare, and that can hold us back at times because we wait until everything's perfect and and we know we don't always have that luxury but yeah. I, I i absolutely feel that preparation is is tremendously important i i remember one of my big uh, mistakes and failures is that i had to give a presentation a hugely high stakes presentation but it was a presentation that i'd given several times before but not to these people and I had all of the information about the people, but I hadn't researched it well enough to understand how to tweak this presentation specific to those people. And it was right after the pandemic and I absolutely bombed and I wasn't used to bombing. And I remember having that same conversation with myself, like I don't ever want to feel like this again, not ever. Yeah. So the next opportunity that I get, best believe I'm going to, do my research, do the work, and make sure that when I turn up, I understand exactly who I'm speaking to, and I've tailored that conversation to those people so that I don't ever leave having bombs. Yeah. Unless, I mean, I'm going to bomb again. That's a, that's a thing. Yeah, that's yeah. But it's not going to be because I failed to do my part. Yeah. So, you know, I believe that we have the ability. So, so there's, there's research and, and, you know, I talk about this a lot, that there's research that suggests not only do we, um, that this is a foregone conclusion that the best results come when we have a diversity in leadership, which means that we need to have far more women in boardrooms and at the, the C-suite level. That's just a given. But we're also seeing research emerge that we also need more women in leadership at a governmental level to be able to get the best climate outcomes. And climate change is one of those things that, that is transformational. Taking climate action and transforming the way that we do things is, is the challenge of our lifetime. And so I, I, I chose, when I, when I went about selecting the people to speak to in this podcast, I, I purposely picked leaders that I felt were transformational, not just because of who they were, but because of the things that they were able to do and their ability to think differently. So I want to talk to you about an opportunity or a time in which you were a transformational leader and talk us through that journey. Sure. I would definitely say it would be when I first became the CEO and boss. Um, I had taken over the role and at that time the company had been um, losing money monthly. It was unprofitable um, as a result of many different factors that would have happened in the industry and also the organization. Um, at that time, you know, 2015 into 2016 was a couple of hard years. And when I took over in 2017, I was like, okay, what are some of the problems that exist? And I really just started to listen because one of the things, as I said, like I, I try to empower people and let them feel like they are co-creators of the business. So I wanted to hear from them. Some of these people had been in the organization for 20 years and you know, 15 years and they had seen CEOs come and go and they'd seen some consistent problems and, and going through all through the organization. One of the things was very common is that the internal customer service was lacking. Mm -hmm. So each department made it slightly more difficult to serve the customer. 
Wow. So, you know, the accounts relationship with, um, with sales, sometimes accounts would go on hold and accounts wouldn't communicate it. Sometimes sales would do the wrong things and giving approval for credit when they shouldn't have and then money we couldn't collect it. And then the accounts team was uh, upset and, you know, warehouse was always right. And, you know, so they had a lot of internal power struggles. And, and I found this from asking a lot of the questions and just troubleshooting through speaking to staff and, you know, I made it one of my missions to bring everybody closer together and sit with them together and say, um, this is the last time that we're going to have this conversation about another department without them here, because mm -hmm. I'm not going to be the middle person all the time. Okay. Um, you'll need to start talking to each other. So what I want you to do is frame in your mind how you're going to communicate these struggles you're facing to them. Mm -hmm. You know, and we had a lot of honest conversations and bringing people together and other people giving their ideas and, you know, pushing the sales team and, and taking people's, you know, simple, um, simple solutions that people would have brought forward. We implemented, you know, how we package things to save money when it went to Tobago, like lots of little things. And I, I would like to think that through my style, my transformational leadership, in listening and then implementing so it's not just I'm listening to you and I'm making all the decisions myself no right. it is I am I guess I have the final decision but I am gathering data um analyzing it assessing it you know testing it through and then choosing of what I've heard and I feel like taking some of the solutions from the team and implementing it quickly got us to a stage where people felt like oh, okay well she listened to that so let me tell her one more thing and a few things oh. were said and we made some changes and I would like to feel that people felt heard. You know, I, I walked the floors. I spent months in different departments. You know, I spent months in uh, the warehouse department combing every inch. I touched every inch of the warehouse in my boots, you know, and I would think within a year we became profitable, you know, and in 2018, that first month that we made, you know, our profit um, and we started seeing things getting better, it felt good. And, and the first thing that I actually asked myself is, how did this happen? And then I was like, wait, it's happened because of everything that I've done, that they've done, that they've worked on together, because a transformation is just that it doesn't happen overnight, mm -hmm. you know, so you're toiling away, having the hard conversations, pulling people together, you know, debating, getting better, making mistakes. And, and it takes time until one one opportunity that you look around and you say, OK, we're, we're doing it, you know, so, so so to see the organization be in an unprofitable state to being one that is profitable um, felt good. You know, so it, it, I think my style of leadership, whereas it's, it's slightly different, you know, some people have always told me, you know, um, nice girls don't always get the corner office, you know, and um, you can't make hard decisions because they think that I'm pleasant uh, or amiable. And I, I, I just because I can smile and I wear lipsticks, you know, sometimes and I care about how I look and I can be pleasant doesn't mean I can't make hard decisions and it doesn't mean I can't discipline someone and it doesn't mean I can't be transformational. So I think, you know, people have a wrong idea sometimes about what transformation looks like, you know, mm -hmm. because they think it's just, sometimes it's this hard, edgy, no nonsense, and, and it isn't. It's, it's many things, which comes back to your point of diversity, because everybody is different. People make different decisions and how decisions are made are different and how to get to different decisions and different executions are going to be different for different people. So it is it is so important to have diversity because we are not moving everybody of the same kind in one direction. Definitely not. And it's 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 so remarkable. I mean, what you're talking about and being open, you know, question leadership, making sure that you're asking the right questions and you're teasing out the information, um, you know, being really hands on. I think that's really important. You know, understanding the business from the ground up is such an asset, so important in leading an organization because you need to understand not only how the business runs, but hear all of the voices throughout the organization and what they think. And I mean, you know, it's so insightful of you coming into this new organization and understanding, listen, 
you know, I am here to lead, but I'm also here to listen. And in listening, we'll understand how to bring all of these pieces together to, to, tr to turn the business around, to yeah. transform this organization. I absolutely I think so, so important, such important uh, lessons for all of us. I really, really like that. What do you think were some of the skills that you needed or the skills that you needed to acquire? So for example, if you are um, helping somebody else along the way and you're saying, here are some of the things that I would encourage you to, to invest in, to learn that will help you in this journey towards leadership. Emotional intelligence. Mm. for certain I mean the word the term is thrown around a lot you mm -hmm. know um and there are many there are four main categories emotional intelligence and a lot of people harp on the self-awareness piece you know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so self-aware I, I know myself I know what drives me um but it's that social awareness piece where you know how to say something and what to say and how you feel about it but it's understanding what another person will react how the other person will react but then doing something differently yeah so and that piece is one that I struggle with so a lot of a lot of my early on in my career I knew myself I knew how another person would react but because I was a passionate and impulsive I knew what I said might piss somebody off or rub them the wrong way but I don't care because I think I'm right and I want to say it Right. And I, you, I said it anyway, and I, and I upset some people. Yeah. And, you know, as, as you grow older, that, that emotional intelligent part says, okay, you might have the answer. How is shoving it down their throat going to help this how is that going to help you? Yeah. You know, um, how is that going to yeah, reflect on them? Yeah, on my journey, certainly I started out that way and I have mellowed a great deal. And I'm <laughs> sure my team would be really, um, find it really funny to hear that I'm mellow now, but... The thing is, you have to think about what is the objective that you're trying to meet? So, you know, is being right always the path to the objective that you want? Or is being more collaborative or, you know, sometimes just letting it slide? Is that yeah. the path to what you want to get done? And, and yeah. you, you know, this is, this is chess, not checkers. So you've got to think about, yeah, I can make this move and it makes me feel yeah. better. But does that help me get to checkmate? Yeah. And emotional intelligence isn't something you learn in high school, the primary school. I mean, it, it's something that you have to, you know, there are many MBAs that kind of touch on it. There's certain areas like courses that you can do, books that you can read. But for me, it's not a natural in your course of learning and business, you're going to fall onto this topic and get yeah. absorbed into it and understand it, you know. So a lot of that work um, you just, I, I did on my own because my, one of my previous bosses saw me make some blunder and was like, read this book. The what was the book? What was the book? Um, it's, it's just emotional intelligence 2.0. Um, okay. I can't remember the name of the guy who wrote it, but it's, um, it's fine. Daniel fine. Wolf. Yeah. I think it's Daniel Wolf's. So I should really just know his name, but it's, he's like one of the people who like coined the terms um, mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's an easy read and it breaks it down very simply. So um, it's something that I thought, as I said, I was told to read it. I was instructed to read it by my boss at a point in my career mm -hmm. and uh, I was really appreciative of it. Is it, is it your favorite book? It isn't. It is not. It's, it's one it? of the top ones that have been the most useful. Uh, okay. My favorite book is uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins. Hmm. Okay, that's a good one. That's a good one. You know what? I, I've read recently, um, emotional, uh, not emotional, um, digital body language. And that was really interesting. And I, I love that it has a female author, but it talks about how, you know, our body language needs to be different in a digital age. And, and, and that's, that I thought was quite useful as well. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And so what's your favorite quote? Um, you might, the quote that I quote to myself, I don't know if it's a quote out there, but, but you can only do your best and your best is good enough. Okay. Um, right. I, I usually say that because your best is not the same on every day, you know, yeah. but yeah. your best needs to be your optimal give, you yeah. know, whatever your optimal give is. Love it, love it, love it. And what do you what do you do to take care of yourself? I think it's so important for us to take care of ourselves as we are on this journey because it's great to sort of go full hundred and try to to change the world. And, and we're all trying to change the world from our unique perspectives, but you have to take care of yourself. So how do you take care of yourself? I think just having alone time and just you know sitting with myself, whether it's just on my porch 
or I sometimes just scroll through my social media, which, which has its time. I have my alone time, no phone time. And then I have my phone time where I'm watching like the most ridiculous cat videos and, you know, the real nonsense, little puppies rolling over or hedgehogs in a bath, like total ridiculous things. Like I like watching stuff like that. Like some people will be horrified, um, but I just spend time by myself where I don't have to talk or engage or be for anyone. It's just me. Okay. And I can have that quiet time, whether it's, you know, running a bath or sitting on a porch or watching some nonsense, having that space and that downtime for me. And I think it's so much easier for someone like me who does not have kids. So I feel like whenever I give that example, because people do often ask me, how do you take care of yourself? What do you do to keep your sanity? Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of it is just not having kids. Not having kids gives me a lot of time to have for myself, you know? So I think, you know, sometimes when I say, you know, take time for yourself and I see my sister and my friends and I'm, I'm like, how do they do it? I, I would always encourage people to take time for themselves. And I understand as a parent, it's a different task in and of itself, but okay. even if- Absolutely, even more necessary. Even more necessary, you know, I know it's a challenge because, you know, some people have been like, oh, Jane, it's easy for you to say, take time for yourself. I'm like, listen, it, I could easily just be a workaholic, but we all yeah. can take five minutes, seven minutes, you know? So I would just encourage someone to do that. Wonderful. Jane, thank you so much. You gave us such great insights and great, you know, a, a great view into the, the internal workings of how you your unusual leadership path. And, and that's what we want. It's not, it's not going to be okay, well, you were head girl and you were valedictorian. Yeah, you get to be it. It, it is going to take a number of different kinds of people with a variety of lived experiences to make up the leadership tapestry that we require to transform this world. So I encourage all of you listening to please, please, please uh, pursue leadership and pursue it from your own perspective. And you have something to add and something to give. And I hope you, we see you on your journey. Thank you so much.